Welcome everyone to uh, this event this evening, um, hosted by St Edmunds College, but attended by many. I'm Kate Glenny. I'm the uh, Director of Development and Alumni Relations at St Edmunds. Um, just a little bit of background on this event. This is actually a, a, a kind of rescheduled virtual event from something that we had planned to do in person back in April that obviously had to be um, postponed due to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And we're just really thrilled to have so many of you um, here this evening. Um, the idea to have this event and to hear uh, Nicola Bowman speak about um, Persephone Books and the, um, the kind of um, the origin story of that company uh, came about last year um, when we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the admission of um, women to St Edmunds College. Um, on a technicality, I believe we were the first all-male college to allow um, women to matriculate, although we, strictly speaking, weren't a full college of the university, so there's some, uh, some, some kind of wiggle room on that. Um, as we sort of sat around and thought of the various different ways in which we could celebrate that, that wonderful milestone, um, we thought of fundraising ideas um, and having spoken to Suzanne, um, our librarian, we thought that buying the entire collection of Persephone books would be a really um, fitting uh, tribute. Uh, we launched a GoFundMe crowdfunder appeal um, about this time last year and um, we uh, had uh, various alumni contribute and raise the funds um, in, in their entirety to, to buy the collection. And we were really thrilled to uh, take delivery of them um, earlier in the new year. Um, I'm now gonna hand you over to Suzanne Jennings, our college librarian, um, and very much the driving force behind um, both uh, the purchase of the collection of books, and also um, we're very grateful to her for connecting us to Nicola Bowman um, and um, uh, sort of enabling this event to come about. Um, we're one of only three uh, places in Cambridge to have the collection of books, uh, I believe just uh, us and Newnham College and then also the University Library. So over to you Suzanne. Thank you very much Kate. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have Nicola Bowman here this evening and um, just to say that the idea for um, starting a collection of the Persephone books was because Ailey, um, they're so elegant and they are authored by neglected women writers who represent the spirit and excellence of the women who have been part of St Edmunds College for the past 50 years. They also are, um, I suppose their spirit is encapsulated by their foundress. Um, and as Kate was saying, we are only the third college, um, the third library in Cambridge to have this excellent collection. I'm now going to hand you over to Nicola, who will tell us about the founding of Persephone. Lovely. Um, it's really wonderful to be talking to you all. And I want to thank you, first of all, St Edmunds, for buying all the books. As I was just saying, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, about three times a year, somebody buys all the books, which is now 139 titles. It, I think, was about 130 when St Edmunds bought them. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to say was, I'm always very wary when I talk to people because Persephone Books has been in existence for 22 years. I'm very wary of being boring and talking to people and telling them things that they may have heard before. So it's really difficult to know, in a sense, how to pitch it, because you might be sitting there thinking, well, I know all this. So what I thought I'd do to try and make it a little different was give a very quick intro to how we started and why. And then I would explain how the two new books, which were just published this week, um, how they come into being, that the whole process for creating a new book. 
So some of you will have heard me say this before, and it's a rather embarrassing thing to say to a group of Cambridge people. But when I was at Newnham, I wasn't very happy reading English because it seemed to me, although I couldn't really articulate it, it was quite a hard thing to know when you're only 20, uh, quite narrow. Um, I wasn't interested in tragedy. I wasn't interested in Milton. But I didn't have the maturity to think that the fault wasn't in myself. It's just how I was. So I didn't shine at Cambridge and I didn't work hard enough. And then when I was in my late 20s, mid to late 20s, actually quite young, and a mother of young children, because in those days we all, or a lot of us, had children much younger, I started working on interwar women writers. It was very, very focused and it just sort of came to me that that's where my interests lay. And I started collecting them. It was, of course, very difficult to buy them because it was long before the days of something like ABE. So it was quite difficult to get hold of books. And eventually I signed a contract to write a book about them. Um, it was 1973, so I was 29. Uh, then I never wrote the book uh, for complicated domestic reasons until 10 years later when I did write the book, uh, which is called A Very Great Profession, and it's about women writers between the wars. And really, I never looked back in terms of my obsession. I always think a working life is so much better if people really know what to use a modern idiom, what their passion is, but what we would have called what they were obsessed by. And I was rather obsessed by those women writers. Uh, after I wrote A Very Great Profession, I wrote a biography of Lady Cynthia Asquith, whose picture, I'm going to tilt the screen. There, you can see her. Um, the reason I have that wonderful portrait is when I was writing about Cynthia, um, I went to see someone who owned it and he intimated that he didn't love it. And I said, if you ever want to sell it, do contact me. So we have this amazing portrait of Cynthia. Um, and then of course, I wrote about my hero who is not a women writer. E.M. Forster, he could not be more central to Cambridge and central to a Cambridge person's values in terms of decency and, oh gosh, all the values that I see when I read that magazine, Cam, which I always love because I love the photographs of the people in it. It's just values. And Forster had all those values. Um, then, um, in the late 90s, so 22 years ago, I almost literally overnight decided that I would start reprinting the women writers that I loved. Of course, I'd always offered them to Virago, and Virago had taken some of my suggestions. They'd taken um, Diary of a Provincial Lady by E.M. Delafield. They'd taken one Fine Day by Molly Panter Downs. They'd taken Margaret Kennedy. So we were reading off the, hem the same hymn sheet, but a lot of books that I loved, in fact, 139 books that I loved, which is what we've got to now, uh, they didn't love. And so I started doing it myself and we rented an office in a basement in Clerkenwell and I decided to be mail order because I knew that busy women like myself didn't really have time to go to bookshops. And then as some of you will have heard me say already, which is why I'm rather skirting over all this, uh, we were incredibly lucky, a bit like a dream really. Um, and one of our books became a bestseller. Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, 
was a bestseller. So we moved to our shop in Lamb's Conduit and we've been there ever since. And we publish four or five books a year and we sell mostly by mail order. So we sell by sending people the Persephone biannually, that's upside down, there we are. And this just went out yesterday. And people either order online or they telephone us and have a chat, quite an old fashioned thing. They write a letter or before the pandemic, they came into the shop. And some people do come into the shop, uh, but of course, far fewer and well only open 12 to three. So I thought having given a quick sketch of why I started Persephone Books and what our basic remit was, I would explain to you in a little more detail about the two new books that were published this week. Uh, but unfortunately, in a way, because it's a bit left field, one of them is by a man. So you are thinking, well, I thought Persephone reprinted women writers. And we do mostly women writers. But I was always very intent on something that nobody's yet written a book about, but one of you academics out there, I'm waiting for you to write it, which as a shorthand, I call domestic feminism. And if you madly Google domestic feminism, you won't find anything. Because it isn't a concept that has so far interested academics or got people to write about them. And I always want to write about it, but you know, to write a book like that would take two years of doing nothing else. Um, at the moment, I'm doing Persephone books. And what domestic feminism is in shorthand is the kind of deep-rooted, inevitable, total feminism, which people like me feel, but combined with a domestic life. And a domestic life doesn't just mean cooking and children, it's an attitude of mind and it embraces uh, interior decoration, um, clothes, it embraces a whole way of life and is actually a rather interesting subject and someone will do a book about it one day. So domestic feminism embraces men and that's why I find it not at all odd that Forster is actually my favourite novelist, but was a man. Um, most of our writers are women, but we do have R.C. Sheriff, who wrote Journey's End and was a film writer, uh, but also wrote three, well, he wrote six novels. Three of them are absolutely amazing. We've done a fortnight in September, which has been a bestseller, and two others. We have the Vicomte Maudoui, who wrote a book about food for free in 1940 called They Can't Ration These. We have Operation Heartbreak by Duff Cooper. So we do have a few men. And so when somebody said to me, have you read Wilkie Collins' The New Madeline? I wasn't a bit put off by the fact that Wilkie Collins was a man. And I read it. And I thought, this is a, definitely a Persephone book. Uh, the New Madeline is about a young girl, she's now 24, who was orphaned, had no money, scraped a living in the way that, because the book was written in 1873, in the way that very poor people had to, then, well, of course, and now, alas, but in the 1860s, she was a seamstress. Then one day she went out from the terrible attic where she was employed uh, and she was knocked down. And when she came to her senses, she'd been drugged, she'd been raped. This is obviously very much glossed over in the book. 
and she has had through no volition of her own she has become a prostitute she escapes and she goes to a women's refuge and she becomes a nurse and the book opens with her as a nurse and she then exchanges identities with someone else and this is not giving the plot away because it this is in chapter one and the rest of the book is about her trying to not just atone but trying to give herself a position in society uh, it doesn't end brilliantly uh, but it ends reasonably happily so this is Wilkie Collins's The New Madeline. And the other book that we've done this week is a book by our best-selling writer, Dorothy Whipple. So we have a bestseller, Miss Pettigrew, but we also have a best-selling writer. Uh, we've done all her books now and her short stories. And once you've read Dorothy Whipple, basically you have to read them all and people absolutely love her. I mean, you know, compared with Harry Potter, they're not huge figures. So something like The Priory, which has been in print for uh, 15 years, we've sold 15,000 copies. So, you know, it's o only a thousand copies a week. Um, but it, that is for us wonderful sales uh, sorry not a thousand copies a week that's wish 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 fulfillment um uh, a thousand copies a year over 15 years but it those are very very good sales for us so this book by dorothy whipple is a non-fiction book it's called random commentary and it's probably ever so slightly based on leonard wolf's edition of Virginia Woolf's Letters and Diaries called A Writer's Diary, which had come out 10 years before. But Dorothy Whipple, of course, was so modest, she would never have even breathed her name in the same breath as Virginia Woolf. But it slightly gave her the idea, I think, to go through her diaries and pick out all the bits which are relevant to her writing life, her difficulties of getting down to it, her, the time she scraps what she's written, the very few occasions she ventures to London and has lunch with her agent and is offered champagne or rather Bollinger and doesn't know what it is. And it's full of her wonderful dry wit. However, it's not a book if you've never read any Dorothy Whipple, because uh, you wouldn't think it was fun. So how do we actually go about bringing those books from the printed word to the grey edition? Well, the Wilkie Collins obviously is available free on things like Project Gutenberg. So we take a free copy and we send it to our typesetter, as we still call him, and he keys it in or has it keyed in and then proofreads it and puts it into our font and our format sends it to us it's then proofread twice actually more like four times a few changes are made uh, like we have s spelling not z spelling we use far fewer hyphens than they used some words the spelling has completely changed uh, we have someone write a preface and on we go now in the case of this book the new madeline rather too late after i'd sent it to the typesetter i discovered that the edition that had been used on the free ebook that we downloaded was actually corrupted by a publisher in 1891 and we then had a great deal of difficulty getting hold of the first edition and then had to proofread all over again making sure that we use the first edition because i'm trying to make the point that although i'm not an academic 
I actually have very academic instincts and I would be mortified if a book wasn't done as scrupulously as possible. So this is a first edition of the Wilkie Collins, but redone for the 21st century. And the whole process of uh, setting the book and proofreading and getting the preface written and then choosing the end paper, because uh, all our books have end papers, which are the same date as the book. And then we don't have um, blurbs. We have what we hope are interesting quotes on the front flap. Um, all that process takes um, five or six months. Um, while, of course, everything else is going on, all the other books and life and the shop. Um, and random commentary has been done facsimile, which means basically it's photographed. And the reason for that, um, about 5%, um, no, 10% of our books are done facsimile. The reason we do that is if it's very, very complicated to reset them, or if we feel that the original author wouldn't have liked it. So for example, our cookery books are always facsimile because proofreading the recipes would be so terrible that really we couldn't do it. So we always do cookery books. We did random commentary facsimile because we felt that Dorothy Whipple would have preferred that. The disadvantage, is that she was so modest, she had no dates. You can tell a few dates, obviously, from when her books were being written or when they were published, but she didn't have a chronology. So we wondered whether to kind of insert a chron chronology, but we finally decided against it and we've published it exactly as it is. So those are the two books. They have their end papers. Oh, the, um, the Dorothy Whipple end paper is quite interesting. It's 1936 and it's by someone called Eva Croft, who was Laura Knight's sister. And of course, completely forgotten, overshadowed by her sister. It was impossible to find out anything about her, rather sadly. Um, so those are the two books. They then go to the printer. They're printed in Germany. We've been printing in Germany now for 15 years, uh, not on grounds of cost, it's probably more expensive, but for one reason. Well, A, they're very, very efficient and nice, actually, our printer, GGP. Uh, but B, I'm obsessed with this thing. I don't know if anybody else has ever noticed, but if you open one of our books flat, like this, and then open it again, flat. You haven't cracked the spine. You can then close the book and you can sell it because it wouldn't be ruined. And it's a method which in GGP in Germany they call dispersion binding. And the reason it's called that is because the glue is dispersed in a certain way. And it's a special glue. It's not that very tough glue and they do that for us and i've never found a british printer that would do that if you take a normal paperback as you know when you open it uh the pages crack and i find that terribly distasteful so those are our two new books then i write the biannually um and for example, which has articles which are sort of relevant to our books. First, it, first we write about the two new books, and then there's an article about the textile designers and things like that. And then the biannually goes out to 20,000 people in the UK and 5,000 people abroad. And then the idea is that over the next two or three months, 3,000 copies of each book will sell. And then as we print 3,000, if 3,000 do sell, uh, then we reprint. 
And then we keep the books in print, as I explained about the Priory, and the whole process continues. So physically, what happens to the books is that the books are stored at, a, we now have a distributor called Central, and the books are stored there, and then we keep a couple of hundred copies of each title in our basement, and we send those out ourselves physically. We put them in envelopes, and the postman collects the mailbags every day, sometimes only two mailbags, but sometimes 20. And you can buy books in a box, you could buy a whole lot of books in a box for much less postage. We do the Persephone box set, so you can have six feminist books or six Dorothy Whipple books or six books for the person new to Persephone or six books for the new mother, that kind of thing. And so you can see we are also um, quite obsessed with whether we can sell the books because if we can't sell the books, we can't keep going. So happily, since 2001, when Miss Pettigrew took off, we have been in profit. Um, not huge profit, not the kind of profit that, you know, big companies would think was profit, but very, very nice, small profit. And we're very proud of that fact. And we'd be mortified if somebody thought we were, you know, just women in a shop doing it because we enjoyed it. We do enjoy it but we also want to make a success of it. But when it comes down to it, when, when all is said and done, why are we doing it? Well, the answer is for the women writers. I mean, I love our women writers so much. I think they are so underappreciated, so brilliant. There's a whole host of them. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and sometimes somebody will mention one that has not had their moment in the sun for a while. I mean, for example, this week, somebody sent a tweet about round about a pound a week, which is about poverty in Lambeth in 1912, uh, because it's not a bit patronising. It's not a bit saying, as I'm afraid the Tory government tends to say, well, you know, it's people's fault that they should know better how to cook cheap food, da 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 da. These women in Lambeth literally did manage on a pound a week. And how on earth did they do it? And that's what round about a pound a week is about. Or somebody else mentioned one of our actual worst sellers, I'm afraid, which is Eugenia Ginsburg's Into the Whirlwind, which is about being in a gulag. And of course, it's a poor seller because uh, it's really depressing, but somebody obviously loves it. Really, the books that sell are more feel good. Um, we have poetry, which doesn't sell. We have some books which are on university reading lists, but alas, not in this country. Uh, in Canada, they have taken two or three. I've done my best. Uh, I know that my authors will be recognised much more than they are one day. Uh, if you notice a slight tone of frustration in my voice, well, I'm not ashamed of it. It is quite frustrating. Uh, it's the same old names, same old, same old that PhDs are written about. If it's not Virginia Woolf, it's Winifred Holtby. If it's not Winifred Holtby, it's Rebecca West. It's as though people can't get the money for PhDs unless the people allocating the money have heard of the names. And it is annoying because we have so many wonderful writers who ought to be written about. Would anybody like to ask any questions? If not, I could go on talking about the end papers or the shop or the writers, but are there any questions? So there are a couple of questions come through in the Q&A box, so maybe you could answer them and then there's a few and then maybe you can kind of carry on again. So um, the first question is, is kind of more of a general question about the skills needed to have an author 
uh, sorry, the skills needed to be an author and what needs to be done at the beginning. Um, if I just go through them all now, uh, somebody wanted just clarification of the names of the two authors that you talked about, who were your kind of recent additions to the collection. And then somebody asked a question about who owns the copyright to these books. Oh, well, that, that's a really interesting question. Well, the first question, perhaps I didn't emphasize enough. Um, we really only publish interwar writers, although obviously Wilkie Collins is 19th century. Um, so was the question about how to get published? Uh, I, I, it's it, of, it, I think it's more general do. about kind of uh, this, the, the sort of um, the skills needed to be an author. Um, do you mean then or now? Probably um, now. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> um, that I don't have a clue. Um, except persistence, I'd say. I think that that sounds about right. So um, if we do if we do a quick one, which was just the clarification. Um, for... Two new writers. Well, one's Wilkie Collins, mm -hmm. and the other is our best-selling writer, Dorothy Whipple. But um, as soon as we've stopped, you can look at our website, and everything's very clear there. Um, the copyright issue is really fascinating, um, as you probably know. It's seventy years since the death of the author which now the author would have died in 1950, i.e. 70 years. Uh, it was 50 years for a while. So Virginia Woolf came out of copyright. Then it went to 70 years and she went back in copyright. Then because she died in 43, obviously, sadly, she's out again. Most of our writers are in copyright. And because most of them died um, after 53, but um, obviously there's some like Virginia Woolf, Catherine Mansfield, Francis Hodgson Burnett, well, obviously Wilkie Collins, you know, who aren't in copyright. It's quite um, taxing and difficult sometimes finding out the copyright holder. Um, uh, the copyright laws are different in America from here which also creates complications because we have some American writers. Uh, this is the point where um, I'm sometimes tempted to make a remark anti-agents, but I think I will behave nicely and not make a point anti-agents. But let me put it another way. Uh, when the copyright holder is the family, which in about um, 25 cases it is, we always have the most wonderful relationship. I don't mean that we um, are mean to them, we're not. I just mean that they're friendly and helpful and it's a joy actually. Uh, but um, Dorothy Whipple is represented by an agent and Sheriff, R.C. Sheriff is, and Margarita Lasky, whom I haven't mentioned, but is a brilliant writer, and one of our best sellers. So then we have two, two people wanted to know more about the end papers. Uh, one person asks, who selects them? How much do you argue about them? And is that one of the most exciting moments of the book? Oh, um, and, and kind of uh, somebody else has asked about how you match the particular end papers to the, the different books. Uh, the end papers, we don't argue because we don't have time. <laughs> uh, if we can find one that we like, then we just go with it. Um, as you know, I, did I say this, they're always the same date as the book. Wow. So uh, for Wilkie Collins, um, it's the same date as the book. Uh, this had the extra gloss uh, that the designer did some work for George Eliot and Lewis in their house in Regent's Park. And of course, Wilkie Collins knew George Eliot and G.H. Lewis. So I rather like that synergy. Um, and the Dorothy Whipple, I simply chose the Eva Croft end paper because Eva Croft has been totally overshadowed by Laura Knight and it was rather wonderful to be able to bring her into the limelight. Um, it, you, you would have no idea how quickly things like the end papers or 
the quotes on the jacket are dumb mm. because there are only really two of us who run Persephone Books. There's me and then every day of the week there's someone different. There's Lydia or Rosie or Maud or Sophie and they're busy doing the orders. Mm. So we're run on a shoestring. Um, you know, some publishers with our turnover would actually be employing a few people. But I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, no, we don't argue because there's no time. The two people have come through and asked questions um, about selecting the authors. Um, one person asked about um, how did you make the decision about the very first books that you published? And then a kind of more general question about, about the decision making process around choosing the, the first books actually are interesting. Um, so the first one is a novel about the First World War called William an Englishman, written in a tent in 1918. And that one particularly, I'd always been thrusting at Barago, saying this is the best novel ever written about the First World War. And they disagreed, fair enough. Uh, the second book we did was deliberately light-hearted. I mean, it's got deep themes, but Mariana by Monica Dickens, um, it's not exactly like Call the Midwife, but it caters to the same kind of audience. It's a, it's a, it's a hot water bottle book that you read on the sofa on a Sunday afternoon. Mm. So that was deliberate to contrast with William and Englishman. And the third book was the first Dorothy Whipple, whom I've always adored, always been frustrated that people couldn't read her. Mm. And it's her last book, written in 1953, but technically her best. Why no one out there has done a PhD on Dorothy Whipple, do not ask me. Well, actually I know one reason, if any of you are thinking that you might. Um, she's very, very hard to do what you might call literary criticism on. Mm. She, it's a cliche, but what you see is what you get with Dorothy Whipple. And she's very strong on plot. She's very humane. She's wonderful about people. None of these qualities are actually what they're looking for when they want you to do a PhD. Mm. One day someone will. Anyway, so those were the first three and that's why. Yeah. Uh, then number four was something else totally again. Uh, Etty Hillison who was in Amsterdam during the war and refused to hide underground and wrote letters and diaries and eventually was sent to Auschwitz. So that showed we were not just going to be hot water bottle, feel good, but we could cope with the grittier, the great person. So those were the first four. Yeah. And then one final question that I've had come through is about um, what your future plans are for Persephone books and what your current personal favourite book is. I don't have a favourite. It'd be like having um, a favourite child. Um, I mean, I've got many books I could go on and on about. For example, we did one a couple of years ago called Despised and Rejected by Rose Alatini, which is about a gay conscientious objector. It's absolutely superb. Um, it has this great flaw that it starts very slowly, like a sort of sub-Edwardian novel in a, um, in a country house hotel with a family that's gathered. And you think, oh God, this is like sub Forster. And then Dennis, who's gay, arrives. And you realize he's gay. And then he has his great friend who's lesbian, but hasn't realized it. And then the First World War breaks out and he becomes a conscientious objector and is sent to prison. And, oh God, it's the most amazing book, but actually hasn't sold that well. Um, one interesting thing is we can't get reviews. I never manage. And of course there's so few places for reviews mm. um, now. You know, The Guardian is getting thinner and thinner and, and they have to do new books really and it's really quite hard. As to future plans, um, it's very hubristic when you're my age to say, well, we're just going to keep going. So I often bite my nails and think, well, should I stop? Should I hand over to someone else? But it's difficult to find someone who has this 
ridiculous passion for the women writers. Um, should we stay in Lamb's Conduit where we've been 20 years, which perhaps is long enough, and perhaps we should have a new adventure? And so the answer is, to tell you the truth, um, our lease is up next year in Lamb's Conduit in June, and I am going to have to make a decision about what we do, uh, but I haven't yet. Um, and I had a question, actually. I was wondering, I was reading something today about how printed book sales had gone up, obviously, um, in the last sort of nine months during the lockdown. Have, how has that, the, the kind of, the, the, the world that we've been living in, how, how has that impacted your sales? You said you were very busy and people were uh, going... online sales day. doubled. Wow. Uh, but we only had one person going into the shop every day. Yeah. Therefore, you'd go into the shop and there'd be 600 backed up orders. Now, for us, normally we're only 25 orders behind. So mm -hmm. to have 600, basically it took two weeks to get the book out. And then we had this other stress, uh, which is people would email or ring up if we answered the phone and say, where's my book? And literally we had to invent a character called Mary, who was always patient and always polite and said, I'm terribly sorry because of the pandemic, we've got a backlog and we're doing our best, because it was really, really difficult. Mm. Um, so then um, two of us at a time started in the shop most days, but I mean like this week and last, somebody who has another job has been self-isolating and couldn't come in. Because you know, there's not a lot of work we can do at home. You can't put books in envelopes at home. Mm. And um, our down turnover has doubled. However, uh, a large part of our sales used to be from people in the shop. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I don't want to be mean about money because we've been incredibly lucky. Uh, but the shop sales are right down. Mm. And the, um, the mail order is right up. And now I'm worried um, that we're going to get a backlog again because who knows if we're going to have another lockdown. Mm -hmm. So yes. Yes. Um, a couple more questions have come through. Uh, somebody asks if you have any favourite opening lines of a book. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, we have a diary, which we've done every couple of years, although not this year. And by, so each, each month has an end paper and then the opening line of a book. And I have a theory that the opening line of a book is incredibly important. And that if it's a weak opening line, uh, I'm not really sure the book's going to pick up, which is awful, but I'm really obsessed with the opening line. And I mean, think of the opening line of Rebecca, how wonderful it is. Uh, so no, I don't have a favorite but I am a bit obsessed with opening lines. Yes, you're right. Mm. And then somebody else has um, suggested whether or not um, uh, you are reviewed online anywhere. So rather than the kind of, as you were saying, the Guardian's getting thinner and thinner. I wonder if anyone's ever done, uh, I don't know, like a blog series on-, on, on Oh the... yes, people have. Yeah. Uh, bloggers are very kind. Mm. And um, in fact, we have a section um, in the, biannually, um, it's called Our Readers Write, mm -hmm. and it's um, people who write blogs and write letters to us. So yes, um, and of course, sometimes we have work experience people, um, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that they do is gather up a list of possible bloggers, and then we send them books. Um, and they write about them. So mm. yes, we do. I wonder, has anyone ever done a podcast about your... Uh, don't the... mention podcasts because we know we should. <laughs> we, know we should ourselves. Lydia and I know we should be in conversation and it should be on our homepage. Mm -hmm. We should do video. Um, and a lot of people do brilliant podcasts. Mm. Um, but the thing is, we'd have to employ someone else 
and somehow it's easier just to go on as we are quite small and not doing the podcast but yes we should <laughs> great well that's all the questions that we've had so far um, I put the link in the chat to everybody uh, to the Persephone um, books website um, and obviously um, if anyone wants to go and have a look and kind of sign up to the mailing list um, so I think oh, yes and also if you see any um, mistakes or typos <laughs> tell Mary in a nice way she's always very pleased it's really useful so you know if you have trouble getting on to the site and asking for a biannually we would like to know about it um yes oh sorry jane ross um has, has reminded me that she asked at the very beginning so i think at the at its height we had um she's asking about how many people are participating in the event we had 41 of us on here um and um i think um, my understanding was we had a mixture of kind of current St Edmunds um, members and then we also publicised the event um, around Cambridge. So we've got some people from I think Newnham and Girton, Murray Edwards, um, but I don't know. I know that we had somebody uh, right at the beginning who said they were in Bangladesh and uh, Jane Ross is in uh, Canada. Um, I don't know if anyone is further flung than that, um, but that's the beauty of Zoom, isn't it? That we can yes. be all over the world. Well, and... Lots of people around the world, mm -hmm. even though postage has gone up massively during <laughs> the lockdown. I don't know why. Well, um, I don't know why. But in France as well. Good. That's so nice. Well, I hope people, if they buy one of our books or get one out of the library, the most important thing is to enjoy them. Mm. Um, I'm very very keen on everybody always having a good read to hand you know mm. and um i'm very keen on a book being readable rather than deep or brilliant <laughs> written or you know i'm keen on plot and page turning mm. so you know and um, in terms of uh, the collection that's at St Edmund's, Suzanne, um, you said that you'd had somebody um, in uh, um, kind of uh, collating and kind of cataloguing the books. Um, when will our current students um, and members be able to, to access them in the St Edmund's Library? Well, they're, yes, they're all catalogued and they've all been processed and we've got lovely um, book plates that we put in them. And we are actually going to be setting them up tomorrow in the library um, and having a lovely display to showcase them mm -hmm. because they are such they're elegant books and they're lovely to hold um, and to return to time and again. listening to this can go tomorrow and get a Dorothy Whipple <laughs> that would make lockdown if it happens again that would make it go in a flash yes Persephone is perfect for lockdown <laughs> <laughs> I've been returning to Diary of a Provincial Lady um, the second time. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful indeed. I know, I know. Um, we just we also do a book called um, How to Run Your Home Without Help, which is 1949. And I feel we've all become 1950s housewives. <laughs> Um, one last question has just come through and then I think we're probably around about time to sort of bring things to a close. Um, it was a question about how you decided on the typographical design. Oh, it was very rapid and um, Baskerville is a great typeface and Gill on the, the sort of book plate. And of course, I had no idea uh, that 22 years later, we'd still be using the same design. Mm. Um, you know, everybody thought it was a bit mad setting up a publishing company. So when we chose that, it was quite quick and, oh, well, it probably won't last. And actually, I've never changed it, um, which, again, saves an awful lot of time and money because we don't have to redesign the book every time. Mm like most publishers, we just, it, it's there, you know, it's the grey, um, and that's a huge time saver. Mm -hmm. um, you can see I'm a great one for saving time because I like to lie on the sofa <laughs> and read a good novel. <laughs> that's my idea of bliss. So mm -hmm. um, I don't want to spend time designing the books. <laughs>
no, I'm joking. We do work jolly hard, but I also feel it's important not to work all the time. You know. Well, thank you so, so much, Nicola. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Suzanne, for kind of um, inspiring us to do our, our crowdfunder last year. Thank you to all of you uh, who are attending. I hope you'll go and take a look at the Persephone website um, or if you're in St Edmunds, um, come and have a look um, at the collection after next week. Um, and um, I hope to see you maybe again at another one of our events.